Hello, and <laughs> welcome to uh, the freshest, fresh out sci-fi show, Psyched. Oh my goodness, I have been plagued with so many tech issues tonight. It took me an hour to set up this stream because my Mac was going so slow, so I've actually had to come onto my laptop and do it from my laptop because that's the only way that I could get this to work. So hopefully it's all good and there's nothing wrong and you can hear me okay. And you'll notice that I had to go to my old like branding style and I've got this crappy webcam and I've got stuff all over the place. That is because I've had to go to my laptop and my laptop doesn't support my DSLR as a webcam. So, cause you need special software for it. So yeah, that's, that's all it is. Thanks, Mark, for joining us. Uh, welcome. Uh, you guys are over here, by the way, which is why I will look over here occasionally just to see what, what's in the comments. Nice to see you here, Mark. Thanks. So, oh, finally, we've got to the final part, or the third part of the uh, the Dark Triad series, and it's been a long time coming. Um, this is a really interesting topic, I think. Hi, Claire. Nice to see you. How you been? Whew. I've been just trying to make this work. That's all I've been trying to do. Anyways, uh, so the third part of the Dark Triad series. Now, this is a topic. This is called Machiavellianism. Now, I have to say, out of the three areas, so that, you know, we've done narcissism, we've done psycho uh, psychopathy, and we're finally on Machiavellianism. And then the next part will be just tying them all together. What is the dark triad? How does it impact people? Why is it so dangerous? Um, <clears throat> so Machiavellianism is the one that I probably know the least about. Least about. And I think it's because it's not as common a uh, descriptor for someone as the other two. So, you know, you hear people say, oh, they're a psychopath. You see a lot of documentaries about psychopathy and stuff. Despite the fact we debunk debunked some myths around psychopathy in that episode. And go back and watch that if you want to see it, because I think that's probably one of the better episodes with, with where we go through the check. We actually go through the checklist to see whether Hannibal Lecter could be classed as a psychopath. And I won't spoil anything. Uh, you have to go watch it. But it's a very interesting outcome. Um narcissism you know people talk about narcissism quite a lot they 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 say people are narcissistic <laughs> you know you hear that quite a lot of the time and i would say that actually uh it's a word that's misused quite a lot but you hear it a lot more it's very rare it's very rare and it was surprising claire i agree uh it was surprising when i when i did that in my in my masters um but you rarely hear people say that person's Machiavellianistic. <laughs> One, because that is actually quite a hard word to say, and I'm surprised I got it out first time. But two, because it's not really something that's in the like the culture of the of of our, you know, it's not in our lingo. It's not in it's not talked about that much. But it is one of the three personality traits that makes up the dark triad. And I think that actually it's spoken about within that context most frequently. It's barely ever spoken about as an independent trait. And and largely because as you as we go through, you'll see that it shares a lot of the same characteristics as psychopathy and as narcissism. Um, so when you're talking about the dark triad, it kind of brings those two things together a little bit, um, but it is its own separate thing. And you, I, hopefully, I'll make it clear why. And I have just uh, kind of had a cold, so I might need to just wipe my nose occasionally. I know it's not attractive, but there we go. That's what happens in the UK when the weather turns. Um, Mark says probably because I, we have no idea where it is. Well, hopefully I'm here to enlighten you a little bit <laughs> as much as I possibly can. So, so hopefully Mark, when you leave here, you'll be like, ah, oh, I've learned something new. Now, what is Machiavellianism? Well, the original term comes from, uh, a writer, um, who, he was like a philosopher and a politician uh, in, I think, I don't even know what era, I think probably like 1600s, 1700s, something like that. Uh, Nikolai Machiavelli. Now he wrote a, uh, a, a, a book. Now there's some, there's some dispute about what the book's intention was. Um, 
it's called The Prince. It's a very kind of interesting read. I have I have a copy somewhere in the set of books up here. I'm not going to go find it now because I've got headphones in and I can't, can't be bothered. Um, but the book talks about a political uh, methodology, essentially. And the idea is that the ruling class uh, use force and uh, the, the ruling class are essentially elite. They are elite and they are above everyone else and they use force and they use any means necessary in order to keep the, the populace in check, essentially. So um, it's about, you know, the individuals at the top of that, the 1% that we talk about all the time, you know, as being a negative thing. It's Ma 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 Machiavelli's book describes that the, the 1% deserve to be there and that they can use any means necessary in order to... Uh, overrule the rest the rest of people you know to get what their needs are to get their uh to get money to get fortune to get uh recognition all of this stuff that's the idea um so i mean that's a pretty simple idea i mean there's more nuance in the book on how to how to achieve that and uh what kind of things are are acceptable and stuff like that um now there's some there's some controversy I think around the intention of Machiavelli whether he was writing it satirically, and saying like actually this isn't a good idea, uh, or whether he was literally writing this as if it was like the best political system that you could have, or or not the best political system but like, uh, like he believed that it was true that the ruling class were above everyone else and therefore were needed to, uh, needed to impose themselves on other people there's there's some controversy around that but either way machiavellianism as a personality trait came from that idea now machiavellianism was kind of uh developed in the 1970s as a, as a concept so you know it's a long time from when uh machiavelli wrote the the prince compared to when uh he you know we're coming up with his personality traits um but the idea is very similar in terms of like you know it's inspired the 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 name of the the personality trait is inspired by the work of, of this writer um so the idea is very simple now in psychopathy and in narcissism we talk a lot about you know people meeting their own needs through stepping on other people and i think in Mach machiavellianism that is the really the core trait is having an elite uh, having kind of elitist view of yourself and and uh valuing money and and status and other things above relationships above uh other people above anything else really so it's kind of like a it's a very selfish uh egotistical kind of like personality style it, it's very ambitious so somebody might want to become you know top of the ladder uh it's very much focused on uh f like kind of physical wealth uh and status um pe people with machiavellianistic machiavellianistic that's such a like an, an interesting word to say um they might they might use Manipulative, manipulative. That's hard to say. How is that harder than Machiavellianistic? Do not worry. Um, they might use manipulative tactics in order to reach their goals, um, such as you know lying or deception or flattery or um, uh, you know kind of bending rules or, or breaching rules. Um, they tend not to have high levels of empathy, so they don't really care about the problems that other people face as a result of their actions. So you're starting to see probably, I think Marx even started to see this as his question says, you know, how would you differentiate between Machiavellianism and narcissism? You're starting to see some similarities here. Now, I would say the difference between Machiavellianism and narcissism is that narcissism isn't necessarily goal-driven. So someone who's narcissistic does believe that they are better than other people, but they're not, they don't believe, uh, they don't have a goal that they're trying to reach in that, in that belief. It's not that they're trying to show that they're better than other people through material wealth, for instance. It's more that they, um, 
I mean, if they have a goal, they're willing to step on other people. Don't get me wrong, but it's more about them just existing as better than other people. Um, they have this innate belief, and and if they if they need to achieve something, then they'll do that through these tactics. Whereas Machiavellianism is 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 about the goal. It's about the ambition. It's about uh, achieving that thing through these tactics because that's where they deserve to be. They deserve to be the head of the company, or you know. Uh, Prime Minister, for instance, you know, I think uh, Boris Johnson shows a lot of Machiavellianistic kind of traits. You know, if we're thinking about, you know, the the main his main goal was to become Prime Minister. It was a position of power, um, and he saw that as kind of a birthright. He was willing to throw his colleagues under the bus in order to reach that uh, reach that goal. When he was in newspapers, he was willing to lie and manipulate people in order to. To progress his career so you know you see these things and i, I agree that it, you know not this is the thing with these traits right they cross over they mix and match so you you kind of get uh like some traits that you'll see in narcissism and they're, they're also in machiavellianism Machia machiavellianism they're not they're not exclusive to each other but it's just about looking at all of the characteristics and figuring out what's the best descriptive for them because there's going to be some overlap and and that's the thing you know the reason that they call these a dark, dark triad is because they interact so much that they come together so much you see them so frequently together that then you can say okay these are the the this is a dangerous personality type if someone has all these three, three characteristics um so some other things that uh you might see is someone not having like long-term romantic relationships they're they're probably kind of lone, not uh, loners, like people that exist on their own. Um, they will have, you know, maybe just casual sexual encounters rather than like meaningful ones. Um, and they can be a bit callous and cold in, in normal interactions with people because they're not, they're not looking at you as like a person. They're looking at you as like a commodity, essentially something that they can use to reach their own means. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, the reason that Machiavellianism is a, is a political Ma Machiavelli was a political uh, philosopher, essentially. That's how we got to think about this personality trait is it's almost all politics. The world is politics. They're trying to achieve something and they're going out and about, and they're uh, manipulating these social situations in order to achieve their own end. Now, I think something that's important to note is that empathy, I think a lack of empathy uh, tends to get uh, misread as someone not understanding other people's social situations or or how they feel so you know you hear you hear people say oh they don't have any empathy therefore they don't understand how this thing would make you feel and i don't know if i covered this in the psychopathy one but that's not how it works <laughs> someone who lacks empathy can absolutely understand that if they call you a uh, a slur that that's going to hurt your feelings and make you feel upset they can absolutely understand that if they punch you in the face that you're going to feel a lot of pain and feel victimized in some capacity they can they can understand that what they don't have is is kind of it's not even the ability they don't have yeah the ability to uh feel sorry for you or care about that so the it's described as like a, a kind of like <clears throat> I think uncaring is probably a better term rather than it being like they don't understand how this would make you feel. It's more that they don't care, you know? Uh, and I, this is where people get confused with people, with autistic people, yeah? Because autistic people have uh, impairments in something called the theory of mind, which is the ability to understand how other people think and feel. So, Autistic people will, an autistic person may struggle more with knowing that if they punch you in the face that you would feel upset and thinking about the emotions behind that. 
and and these two things can can overlap a little bit and people will think that one's the other um when actually if you told an autistic person when you do this thing to me it hurts my feelings it makes me feel sad and i'm sure you don't want to make me feel that way they will quickly learn actually okay i'm not going to do that thing because i've now been told this is how it makes other people feel so it's different for for people with psycho psychopathy or people who lack empathy um because what they are actually experiencing is an understanding that that's how you're going to feel and i just don't give a shit and that's it um mark says i don't think it's a matter of not being empathic they just don't care it doesn't affect them in any way so they just don't care no empathy yeah exactly so the empathy aspect is is not it's not because people often describe empathy as being able to you know understand people's emotions and that's not what it is people they understand your emotions they just don't give a crap about your emotions they don't care if you know if you say oh if you if you um uh fire me then i'm not going to have any money uh for uh to, or to be able to live and feed my children and stuff they'll be like okay not my problem that's your problem and then they'll fire you and they won't care and they may even joke about it and stuff so that's the that's the thing right and that's why you know corporate psychopaths and stuff like that are a real issue at the moment and i would say that probably a lot of corporate psychopaths would meet the criteria for machiavellianism um it's because they are uh they don't care about your thing so they they make it quite high in the in the corporate world because of that you know they will uh be able to step on the, their colleagues' toes and and do things that 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 undermine their colleagues in order to meet their to gain their uh, like you know uh, promotions and stuff like that and get um, high up in the corporate ladder, um, make lots of money and stuff. And also, they could probably sell things to people who don't want them, who maybe vulnerable adults, and exploit weaknesses in other people because they don't care about how that person is affected by that now i must say that you know sometimes they're just not aware of the consequences because they don't care they don't think about them so they may not even think that oh if i fire this person then they're not going to have enough money for feeding their kids they're just like don't care so i'm just going to do it you know now <coughs> excuse me there was a, a a scale developed. Now it's a twenty item scale, um, which scores out of a hundred, uh, called the Mac Four. Now this was developed. This was one of the ones that was developed in the seventies, and it essentially has um, like itemized stuff. It's like psychometric. We're not going to go through it like we did with the the the. Um, psychopath checklist the pclr but it's just worth knowing about that there is a scale to identify machiavellianism in 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 people um and that you know so it's scored out of 100 they use a likert scale which is like a, a specific type of scale in in psychological testing uh it's usually one to five and if you score you know you can score one or two or three or five depending on the or four <laughs> depending on the on how much you identify with that thing and usually it has do not identify at all identify somewhat and identify a lot um or sometimes there's a neutral one we try and avoid neutral zeros or like or like middle ground numbers so sometimes they're six uh because if you have a middle ground number then a lot of people go to the, to the middle <laughs> and you just get a bunch of zeros or, or threes or fives or whatever and numbers in the middle. And that just uh, confuses things a lot of the time. So if you, if you make it even an even number, then someone has to pick either side, whether it's just under or just over. And that gives you a little bit more of an indication of where they are at rather than just picking the neutral response. Um, but this is essentially scored out of a hundred so that would indicate to me that there's five options for for scoring. Uh, oh no, maybe four options for scoring. Um, 
No, it'll be five. <laughs> I was right the first time. Five options for scoring, because if there's 20 items, then there'd be a score out of five for each one, and then a score of 100. And if you score over 60 on this test, uh, then that's when you can be given the label of Machiavellianism. Again, this isn't a clinical diagnosis. It's a bit like psychopathy. It's not It's not the DSM-5 or, or the ICD-11. Um, it, it's a personality characteristic that, that is used to risk manage and risk assess, similar to the PCLR. So a psychologist would use this as a as a tool to understand the person better but it's not a clinical diagnosis like where you can then give that person medication for it um and essentially this is the idea of this is just to help risk manage things risk manage situations so you might have somebody that's committed an offense and you want to understand them a bit better so you give them the mac4 and then you can say okay well this person has machiavellianistic characteristics therefore uh we would recommend extra probationary measures or something you know we're going to put extra things in their parole uh, in order to manage their risk um it's i think uh personally having it as a as a separate personality style from some of the other things is a bit innate to me i think that there are other like narcissistic personality disorder, like psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder, there are other character, there are other labels that we can give people that that have the same indications. Uh, the problem is that they overlap so much that that you know someone might be in the middle, and this might be the better descriptor for them. But it feels like to me that we're right. We're trying to label shades of grey a little bit with Machiavellianism. And I think that's part of the reason why people don't talk about it that much, because it is a lot of the traits that we see in Machiavellianism are accounted for in uh, psychopathy and narcissism and stuff, but they're not all of them, not this particular personality trait. So, <coughs> so I think they're trying to make things more nuanced, but at the same time, they're kind of taking things from other stuff and like, smashing it together to make this one thing that's my personal view though hi lone wolf touch of gray is a fantastic song i don't know it i don't think i probably know it but just don't know the name i'm really rubbish with song names so i'll have a listen uh, after this and then find out if i know it who's it by So that was really quick, actually. So uh, Mark says, I'd always thought my brother is very narcissistic, but now I question whether the correct diagnosis should be Machiavellianistic. They seem so similar, I don't think it matters. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know your brother, but but I think that the, the key difference, so with narcissism, it is really about... Um, that innate feeling that you're better than someone, but there's not necessarily a goal attached to it. And Machiavellianistic, I think, is more goal orientated. So it's not necessarily like you 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 may have this feeling that you're you're better than other people, but it's more about I want to be the best of the best. I'm gonna do any do this by any means necessary. I'm gonna achieve the most money, I'm gonna achieve the most power and stuff like that. I'm gonna get uh, into that position no matter what. And I think that there is a lot of overlap in terms of the how people portray themselves in those two different states, the manipulative tactics, the uh, the apparent appearance of superiority that they hold, um, the fact that they're willing to step on people to achieve achieve that those goals and stuff. Grateful Dead, one of the more popular ones that actually had a music. Oh, okay. I haven't. I don't think I've heard that. So I'm gonna. I'll have a listen. Thank you for the suggestion, Lone Wolf. I would say he's narcissistic then. He has a definite underlying insecurity. See, that's the interesting thing with like narcissism as well, is that it appears like for someone to be a true narcissist, there's usually a lack of insecurity. 
it's usually a although they will they will if they are uh, it's really complex so they don't necessarily have low self-esteem but if they um are challenged in any way they may let lie or they may become aggressive in response to someone undermining their like view of themselves as superior now somebody with an insecurity also has that behavior but they also don't genuinely believe they're better than anyone else they're just presenting as though they believe they're better than other people so you kind of get a weird like thing where people with really low self-esteem appear narcissistic and then people who are truly narcissistic appear like they like they might have insecurity when their narcissism is when they when their kind of narcissistic claims are called into question and those present with a very similar behaviors in that like you get that aggressive behavior or that um or that kind of like lying potentially you know and uh it's very interesting to see but i think that you know you can kind of clinically isolate the two different things in asking them about their beliefs around themselves and other people um and figuring out actually you know if you get them into the right space do they believe that they are better than other people or not and if they don't then it's it's a self-esteem issue and not narcissism even though it appears the same from what i hear you describing i could envision dunning kruger playing a big role in a personality like that uh in machiavellianism or narcissism sorry going wolf just want to clarify <coughs> sorry about my cough as well i literally am the back end of a of a cold it's been going on for days and it's really annoying because machiavellianism i suppose you could get done in kruger because they would kind of like want to achieve what they achieve so they'd want to say like yeah i i know this but also you could get that with narcissism where people are saying i i know um i know this information oh definitely with narcissism yeah yeah because you get that kind of like superiority of like i know everything and then and then they will resort to lying in order to to appear that way as well and they lie confidently you know and that's a manipulation tactic that they have to prove they're trying to prove that they're better than everyone else and they will do they will lie in order to achieve that even if it's about something they have no idea about and i think it's maybe it's less dunning kruger effect more of just a manipulation strategy because i think dunning kruger effect is more like anyone suffers from it where <clears throat> you know somebody who doesn't know very much about a topic thinks they might know more than they do whereas this is they they actively may know that they know nothing about a topic but they just they feel like they're better than everyone else so of course they know it of course they'll they'll do this thing better than you do of course you know so machiavellianism is is very uh dangerous in the sense that you know it's yeah you can't really trust someone who has these personality traits because you know if they're if you get in the way of their goal then they're gonna find a way of removing you from their way you know they will they will stamp all over you and they won't care about the outcome of that um and i think you can probably start to see now we've talked about narcissism psychopathy and machiavellianism you can start to see why this dark triad this this um these three personality styles um will can can kind of coalesce to become really really freaking dangerous <coughs> well dunning kruger is just a description of cognitive dissonance which could be a side effect of what you're describing am i right uh, cog cognitive dissonance so co cognitive dissonance is holding a belief and then it and then you can't hold two two um con contradicting beliefs essentially so you can't you can't hold them both and what happens is that if if you're holding a belief and then it gets challenged by a belief that contradicts it, you either double down on your belief or you switch your belief. So 
with the Dunning Kruger effect, I think it's more of a it's more of a uh, an issue of self assessment and self assessment of com competency, and I think the problem is, is with a lot of people is that they observe someone else doing something, they know very little information about the thing, and then they assume that it's easy because of whatever reason and they know the small amount like let's let's take politics for example like everyone's an armchair politician you know we're looking at the current s situation with like russia and, and the world and stuff and people will say you know well you know we should just go to war with russia or we could do this or we could do that and actually you know we're not none of us are professional uh um Right, Dunning Kruger is a cognitive bias. Yeah, one hundred percent is cognitive bias. You're biased towards your skill set. You're biased to you. You have a, a false self assessment of your skill level, and what happens is that once you've reached a certain point of knowledge and skill, you realise that actually there's so much more to learn, and that you only know a little bit amount, and then that drops down despite the fact that you know more information than you did before, and then it, uh, after a while. Uh, so people who know quite a bit uh, then neg uh, falsely self-assess as being more limited in knowledge than they actually are. And then eventually you get to a point where you know enough, you become an expert and you become more accurate, sorry, at self-assessing your your competency in that, in that field. And you actually say, yes, I do know a lot in this field. So it's kind of like, you're always negatively, uh, keep saying negatively, you're always falsely uh, self-assessing where you are in your journey with knowledge in a certain subject. Now, someone with narcissism will probably assume that they know more than everyone in the room, despite, you know, anyone's credentials, because they have a they have a self-assessment that they are better than everyone. So I guess, but I guess what would happen is the more the information they knew, know, they won't have that dip in knowledge. They'll still just assume that they're better than everyone else. So you'll have more of a straight line than, than like that dip that you get in a uh, traditional uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. That just sounds real narcissistic on the front end. If you never, if you never leave Mount Sweet stupid. Yeah. I like the names that they've given it. It's like Mount Stupid and then the Valley. Or, I can't remember what the Valley is called. <laughs> but, yeah, it's funny. God, my nose is starting to run real bad now. Apologies. <coughs> so, I think now's probably, because I think Machiavellianism, is that, that's pretty much all there is to it. So I think we can probably coalesce all three of these things now, whilst we, you know, whilst we're here. So we have Machiavellianism, we have psychopathy, and we have narcissism. So these three things come together to form what we call the dark, the dark triad, <laughs> Illuminati of of uh, personality, right? Dark triad personality type. So someone with a dark triad personality type will have narcissism they will believe they'll genuinely believe that they're better than everyone else they will believe that they deserve more and that they can do ooh. did i get it quick got it quick hell yeah they will be oh no they're back what They will believe that uh, they d they innately deserve more because of who they are. They will also use manipulative manipulative tactic. I can't say that word. Manipulative tactics in order to achieve, uh, you know, whatever goals they need. Uh, but their goals wouldn't necessarily be specifically driven for power and stuff. It would just be like, you know, okay. Uh, we're in a relationship together and I need, uh, I want to be the dominant figure in this relationship. So I'm going to use abusive tactics to, to 
uh, to dominate you essentially. Then we have psychopathy, which is detailed with you know uh, uh, lack of caring about other people, lack of empathy, uh, history of criminal tendencies in very different ways, uh, conduct disorder as, as a child as well, um, shallow affect, so not much emotional range. Uh, and shallow affects are particularly dangerous because it means that for someone to get excited and uh, aroused, not just in the sexual sense, but just emotionally aroused, they need to uh, do more extreme behavior in order to get that same level of adrenaline rush that we get from, you know, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, going to a cinema and watching a horror film. That won't do it for them. Yeah, so they need more... Uh, stimulation in order to reach that level of arousal and they will seek that out because we kind of do seek out adrenaline rushes and people with psychopathy and, and shadow affects are no different so <coughs> so they might they're gonna have a shallow affect uh, and, and they're gonna have this glib superficial charm so they're gonna appear like they are very sociable care a lot about you, can engage with you. Uh, but then when you kind of get into it, they use a lot of flowery language that doesn't really actually hold any substance. Um, and then finally, we have the third part, which is Machiavellianism, which is having a goal that you're willing to uh, step on people in order to achieve because you feel like you are supposed to be there. So, you know, it's having that uh, uh, that drive and that um, desire to reach a certain position or reach a certain, you know, threshold of money, monetary income or whatever it is, and not caring about the relationships and the people you have in your vicinity. The, the collateral damage isn't of concern to you. Uh, so those three things together means you have somebody who believes they're the best person in the world, uh, who is willing to do anything to achieve their goals and their goals are big and they're trying to reach positions of high positions of power and, and money and stuff like that. And they don't care about the collateral and they really don't care about other people at all. Uh, and they are willing to go to extreme lengths in order to do that. That's dangerous <laughs> because that means that you're going to have somebody who is will literally willing to, to abuse the rules, abuse uh, other people and, uh, manipulate people whilst also having the appearance of being engaging and being uh, uh, like having meaningful conversations with people, getting people's trust and then absolutely completely betraying them. And that's why it's so dangerous. And it can affect a lot of people and they you know, use lots of strategies in order to achieve that hi trusty eight podcast nice to see you here thanks for joining so what's worse being a victim of the dark triad or fetishizing people affected by a dark triad can you clarify what you mean by the second one lone wolf that will really help me with that question are you talking about like for instance like i don't know serial killers or something who have the dark triad and have have abused loads of people and are uh being held up on a pedestal or like made infamous by like TV shows and stuff like that. Is that what you're talking about? Because I can, I can actually talk about this because this is, this is something I find frustrating and it's something that, you know, like the, the Dharma show that come out not that long ago with Evan Peterson, Evan Peters, Evan Peters. <clears throat> Plus all the other things, you know, you had the John Gracie tapes, uh, you had uh, the extremely wicked and utterly evil or whatever it was with Zac Efron. Uh, you had you had uh, the Yorkshire Ripper documentary that came out on Netflix. Netflix is really bad for fetishizing uh, e evil people. Uh, it takes it takes really horrible things and it puts them into a uh, entertainment. So, and it doesn't really focus anything on the victims and the pain that they went through and the pain their families went through. It kind of disregards them and focuses on the 
the killer normally as a a person of interest who we who has done this <laughs> horrible thing but it kind of paints it like it's something that's uh, like we should be entertained by and i think people watch it through that lens rather than watching it through a lens of this is really fucked up and i don't want to see this like i'm like you should watch it in order to i feel like this anyway i feel like you should watch it in order to see how bad people can be how bad the world could be you shouldn't watch it with the aim of enjoying the show like for instance, there was a show that came out recently, a panorama. Um, yeah, okay, I'm totally on board with you here, Lone Wolf. We're having the same rant. So, yes, you're on point. The people who become fanboys and fangirls of, like, bad actors. Yeah, even to the point of being gore with horror and mixing the two things. Absolutely. <coughs> There's a panorama documentary that just come out about uh, a... Um, Secure mental health hospital in, in Greater Manchester uh, called Evenfield. And it talks about the abuse that occurred there. Uh, the, it shows some of the abuse that occurred in that hospital. And there's criminal investigations happening as a result of, of, this, of this documentary. And I watched it. I work in health and social care. I watched it feeling sick that in my industry, there are places that act like this. There are places where abuse occurs where people are treated like essentially animals and, and playthings by the people that are supposed to be caring for them and looking after them. <laughs> Mark Caesar has coffee. Good. I'm glad. Now, I would recommend watching it, but watch it with through the lens of, I need to know the fucked up shit that's happening there so I can protect myself and the other people in my life. If I ever end up in a mental health hospital, I know now what kind of shit could happen so I can be prepared for it and I can speak up against it. Or if one of my loved ones went into a hospital, you know, I'd believe them if they were saying that there was abuse taking place because I know it's, it's possible because of the light that, that this documentary has shone on that now. And I agree. Claire coffee equals life. hundred percent. In fact, I'm going to put that on the screen because it's so true. <clears throat> Now, what Netflix does is it takes documentaries and it makes them entertainment. It acts like like what you said, Lone Wolf, a horror film that really happened. Uh, and people get into like the gruesome details and they they wanna they wanna know about the killer's mindset and they apply these labels and they make them out to be these kind of like extraordinary people that uh have these really interesting psychologies and, and they do like I'm interested in that. I did a forensic psychology masters, but I'm interested in it because I don't want it to happen anymore. <laughs> I'm not interested in it because, uh, because the way I see it, people are kind of hoping that stuff would happen so that they can have these documentaries to watch and these, these dramas to watch. I don't think serial killers should be dramatized. I think what if anything's going to be dramatized, you should dramatize the the stories of the victims, and the serial killer should be a villain in the background that that just appears at the appropriate time and is very limited in uh, their role within within the actual show. There was a great book that I read uh, called uh, "The Five by Haley Rubenhold. It's a story of uh, the victims of Jack the Ripper, the canonical, canonical victims of Jack the Ripper. Now, Jack the Ripper, for those of you who don't know, has uh, historically been uh, seen as a as a prostitute killer, someone who went out late at night in London, in in Whitechapel specifically, and killed prostitutes. Now, what Haley Rubenhold is really trying to do is dispel that myth because she goes through the lives of each of these women that were killed by Jack the Ripper, and one of them used to be a prostitute but wasn't at the time she was killed and the rest weren't prostitutes so this was a myth that was invented in order to devalue the lives of the women that jack the ripper killed to make him his actions seem uh i don't know exactly i think it was to to lessen the impact that that had on people who were interested in the story because if he was just if he was killing 
uh, rich people or whatever, then it's really fucking shit that he's done that. <laughs> but if he's killing poor people who need money and prostitute themselves, immoral people, then you can kind of justify your interest in it a little bit easier. And I think that that, you know, is quite horrible. And there's lots of pushback against Hayley Rubenhold for out in this stuff, but she's a historian. <laughs> you know, she she's done her research. She knows about these women. And only one of them, I think, did prostitution for a short period of time. But most of, most all of them were not prostitutes at the time that they were killed. <coughs> While they are interesting, we shouldn't look at them here as, as heroes in any way. No, absolutely not. There's no reason for us to look at these people as heroes. And if anything, what we're doing is we're we're giving people okay. So there was a there was a I can't remember the 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 kid's name. But our morbid curiosity with killers has come to bite us in the arse. There was a kid that's, I think, on trial at the moment or was recently on trial uh, in America who shot his school up. And there was a video that he took just before he did it where he said, I'm going to be the next... Uh, I think it was uh, the Columbine Killers or something. He said, I'm going to be the next Columbine Killers. And it's our fascination with those killers that led to him doing this because it became a an avenue for him to to become infamous and to, to get a message out there in a way that was uh heard by people you know so we're kind of creating a rod for our own backs by giving people a, a, a source of political uh a political platform you know Anyway, Claire says, I for what I'm glad she got the correct. Yes, I am too. And I would recommend reading that book. It's really great. It really doesn't focus on Jack the Ripper at all. It focuses a little bit on the murders, but it it's not about Jack the Ripper. It's about these women. And I think that, that if we're going to dramatize things, that's how we should do it. We should dramatize the characters, the victims, learn their names. Learn who they are uh, and not focus on the killers. Well, here's the real question. Why has this fetish developed within society? It's not new, just like you described. People were doing this back in Ripper's time too. What's up with us? I think we have like this fascination with the macabre, these, the boogeyman. We need something... Oh, God, sorry. One second. I love how Joe's like space picture comes up for that. <laughs> um, so I think we need a, a boogeyman. We need something to excite us. You know, most of our lives up and now, we don't really come into contact with this kind of thing in our own lives. And uh, it's curious. We, we wonder how people can do such bad, awful things. And sometimes we may even have dark thoughts ourselves. And so we're kind of channeling that curiosity into real life situations. I think we do it with horror films as well. I think part of the purpose of horror films is to imagine that situation and think about how we would manage it or how we would deal with it and that feeling of helplessness and that fear that, that, fear that we feel. And then also, you know, we, we maybe sometimes, you know, think about 
would I ever be capable of doing that? And I think that that cur- makes us curious. And But the problem is that there's a line that we cross, I think, at some point where we forget that these people had a real impact on people's lives. These serial killers killed people who had loved ones, who uh, had colleagues, friends, family, kids, you know, and they weren't just uh, an NPC. They weren't just someone who 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 existed and then just disappeared and, and uh, there was no fallout. There was a real um, impact there. And, and imagine, imagine living your life with the knowledge that someone close to you was taken away by someone who was truly evil and everyone else is just like interested in that and you see videos of it and you see documentaries and all this stuff and you're getting asked by reporters what happened and you're getting asked by documentaries to say your side of it and it's just something that never leaves you then it's just there this trauma i think it's uh it's it's kind of gross that we don't think about that now some of the stuff i think um is some of this stuff is necessary to hear we do need to take it and we do need to think about it and hear it because it impacts on safety for instance you know there was a suffolk strangler in the uk who was a guy from from uh suffolk and he was kill- he was killing prostitutes from from ipswich um and he was a black cab driver was he a black cab- he was a cab driver and he was like taking taking these prostitutes into his car and then killing them and stuff and at the time you know i think he managed to to kill four or five women um and there was a the, there's a real issue with safety female safety then because that was the only way that those women made money so the reason that he was managing to keep going for so long was because you know people who who weren't uh engaged in that kind of lifestyle were safe because they were staying at home they weren't going out and stuff but but it really drew attention to the fact that actually these women are putting themselves in really dangerous positions really dangerous situations and how can we make sure that they're safe in doing that you know it asks it's those kind of questions that you should be taken from it it's like how do we make sure people are safe uh, as a result of you know this this kind of behavior and actually, this is a good. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. As an Uber driver, I've had passengers that are prostitutes. They're ju- yeah, they are talking to them on a normal level. Made me see them as actually quite tragic. So they, a lot of them, have really tragic lives. And and you know, I don't think for the majority of them, I'm not speaking for all of them because I'm sure there there are. There's always people that just that's the work they want to do. But for some of them, it's that's how they make the money. They don't have other options. So, you know, and and. And if we dehumanize them, then we are at risk of uh, not taking the 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 tragic tragedy of a situation where you know women are getting killed seriously because we think, well, that ju- it's just a prostitute. When actually they have full lives, they have people that care about them. They may have gotten into drugs or any all this stuff that led them to that situation. Now, I think. Personally, I think sex work is, is real work. So for women that choose to do it, uh, that's that's good for them. For women where it's uh, the only choice they have, I think that that's you know, really upsetting because um, there should be more support for people in order to... So they don't have... They don't, they're not forced to go down that route. If it's a choice, then that's, that's all, all well and good. I'm, I'm happy. Too often the victims are put aside sensationalized serial killers. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how many how many of Ted Bundy's victims do we know? How many of Jeffrey Dahmer's victims' names do we know? I mean, after drama, I mean I haven't seen it, but I'm sure there's people that know some of the some of the names now, but in a year, are they gonna remember the names or are they just gonna remember Jeffrey Dahmer's name? Same with John Wayne Gracie, same with uh Fred and Rose West, same with uh, the Moors killers, the Suffolk Strangler, all of these people. Uh, the uh, Zodiac killer for the for the Americans in the room. You know how many of the victims' names do we know? We don't. We just know the names of the killers or their nicknames. You know. 
they become tropes in 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 movies as well. I don't I don't know how many films I've seen where you know a couple have driven down to a lake and they're like they're they're like teenagers and they're like about to kiss and then they get killed. That's a trope in movies now, and that's the Zodiac Killer's first murders were was exactly that. So it, it impacts on pop culture as well as uh, uh, it being uh, something that people kind of fixate on in in their and desire for entertainment. My dad made was wasn't wanting wanted me to tell you. Yeah, all right. I was trying to hold off for as long as possible because I didn't want to mute and I didn't want to turn my camera off. But you you were right, Mark. I I I feel much better for having done it. So, <laughs> hi Craig, Craig, how you doing? Long time no speak. You've had some really deep conversations with prostitutes back in the day. Yeah, I'm sure you have. I mean, I I don't. That's, that's the thing. I don't even know if I've met any. And. I'm happy to have not known if I've met any because it means that, you know, I don't judge people. If I have, then that's good. But they're probably... I, they're the same as everyone else. The likeliness that you're going to have a deep conversation with somebody who does sex work is just as just the same as meeting anybody that does any other profession. Oh, I'm good. I'm doing well. Got a Back end of a cold. This is the first time I've streamed in ages. I'm I'm doing it with on my laptop because my Mac is dying. This camera is really bad and pixelated, so apologies for that. But I'm really good, and I'm enjoying talking about the frustrations I have with the fetishization of criminal behaviour. I had some friends back in the 90s who wrote a whole song on a pretty popular album about Ed Gein, and the only mention of his victims was making lampshades out of skin. Well, this is the funny thing about Ed Gein, right? He is a very uh, influential person. If you think of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Science of the Lambs, um, what else uh, has he impacted on? Uh, there's more. Jeepers Creepers, like all of these things, right, that, that came from Ed Gein. I think he killed two people. So, Psycho, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Claire. He, he was he was the, the, the thing for Psycho. He, he's inspired a lot of fiction, but he's kill, he killed two people. Now, I'm not trying to minimize the, 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 the suffering for, for the, the, the two people he killed, but it's interesting to me that he has so many like people that just kill everyone, <laughs> and and he wasn't that prolific. He did a lot of grave robbing, um, and that's how he got all the, the, the you know the, the bones and the skin and stuff. So so yeah, and a lot of people don't know this about Ed Gein that he's not like that. Like they don't know that he. Think, they think of him as this like killer, but actually it was kind of more of a fixation on the dead, I suppose. And he he did have some some uh, well, there's a lot of stories around how he was with his mum and stuff like that. But again, you know, it becomes a folk legend. Like Ed Gein's relationship with his mother has become a a like. A weird fixation for people to to focus on. He was very macabre. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. <laughs> it was actually refreshing to talk with prostitutes. They had no real sense of shame, so they could talk openly and honestly. You don't get that with everyday folk. Yeah, I'm sure that's uh, that's a very interesting take on it. And I'm sure that they've seen a lot of kind of sides of people that lots of other people don't see as well when they, when they've been working you know they've seen the behind the curtain of a lot of uh, the people that they've worked with i suppose that leans into your theory of our fixation on the macabre yeah i mean i just think i think people don't think too deeply about it they don't think they get they get hung up on 
the story of of the killer right they get hung up on their story and and the evilness and uh, they kind of turn it into a uh a bit of a novel for them or a piece of entertainment for them and they don't think about the real world implications of that because it's they don't have access to it because it's so far removed from their day-to-day -day life which is very banal that trying to make that leap is is next to impossible and i don't blame people for doing that what i do have an issue with is that the people who are responsible for producing content aren't thinking about that they're the ones responsible netflix the people who make documentaries and dramas they're the ones responsible for um being responsible for the sensitivity of their content and making sure that their content is uh isn't gonna uh, emotionally damage people because it's they're the ones producing it now if, if people the problem is that you get this demand demand <laughs> uh and they they supply it they supply the demand you know people want to know about the serial killer of the month and they they want to do it and and it's kind of been like that on netflix recently because you had the ted, ted bundy stuff come out then you had the john wade and gracie's hate tapes and you had the yorkshire ripper stuff and now you have the dharma stuff and i'm just like well what's this is it going to be the moors killers next because they're trying to find the bodies in the moors at the moment of of their victims or is it is it going to be fred of rose west or is it going to be the zodiac again you know like who are they going to pick next and then who is society going to collectively kind of go oh my god did you know about this person and what they did <laughs> you know the all the documentaries that have ever been needed to be made on these people have been made we've had all the information about all of this stuff that happened in the 70s and 80s with a, with a few happening in like the 90s and the early 2000s but it, you know we haven't had like a prominent serial killer properly for 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 a while not like the level that we're talking about now and i think that, again that time frame kind of you know there's no active serial killer at the moment so uh that time frame you know creating distance in the past it kind of removes you from from the situation as well um I think you hit the nail on the head earlier. I think you could sum up some the fixation up with no with one phrase. There, but for the grace of God, I go. Yeah. And you are correct. Netflix knows that there is psychology of people wanting to see other bad people to feel better feel about themselves, and it just becomes an industry. It has absolutely become an industry. <coughs> it has actually absolutely become an industry about you know churning out. Uh, the flavor of the months essentially. What happens when they run out of material or shocking enough material? Do these producers start producing more? They'll just go back to it. They'll produce another drama that has has the the, the actor that that people like in it. You know, because you got to think like you know there was probably probably a, a a good enough drama. No, not drama. Sorry, a good enough uh, uh, documentary about Jeffrey Dahmer. 20 years ago you know in the <laughs> in the early 2000s that told you all the information that the drama which has got stuff factually wrong because they're dramatizing it so that they changed parts of the story to improve entertainment factor which again it's like <laughs> this is why i prefer documentaries over dramas when it comes to these kind of things because it's actually telling you the real story not telling you this fictional fictionalized sensationalized entertained entertainment version of it now, if the dramatization was completely true to fact or true to true to the story, I'd be like, okay, they're trying to tell you the story through a drama rather than through a documentary. But that's not what's happening because they change elements. So they're actively misleading people in order to, to produce more entertainment. So people they go then go away thinking about Jeffrey Dahmer in this way. And rather than thinking about who he actually was or how that how that actually played out. Anyways, this was a massive tangent, but thank you for that rant, guys, and I'm glad you guys are all on the same page because I think it is something that we need to reflect on as a as a as a as a society about why are we taking people's tragedy and turning it into entertainment.
it's really really dark like that would be a black mirror episode right where you know you have someone someone be the victim of a serial killer and then suddenly there's a movie about them I can imagine it now. I can imagine somebody's like brother gets killed by a serial killer and then they go out and then there's like posters of the serial killer's face all over on the, on the walls and people are talking about it and there's trailers and stuff that comes up and they're just trying to escape, you know, the, this trauma that they have and everyone is just completely like fixated and asking them about this serial killer. <laughs> you know, they have done this with the People's Temple several times. How many ways has Jim Jones been dramatized and the original documentary done with the recordings from the event is all anyone needs yeah absolutely agree no Claire they're not going to do that because they've 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 softened up Black Mirror as soon as the Miley Cyrus one came out I knew Black Mirror was dead it's totally do you know what I think it is because I think Britain has the UK audience has a stronger uh, gut for dark comedy and for the severity of the stuff that was going on in Black Mirror. Like, the one of the first episodes was the Prime Minister fucking a pig to save a princess, right? <laughs> and then the most recent seasons have come out and they're just so tame compared to, like, how they used to be. And the, the consequences aren't as strong. Like, the Miley Cyrus one, everyone's happy at the end. They succeeded. And it was like, this isn't very Black Mirror. And the Assassin's... <sighs> White Bear was about crime. Yeah, the White Bear episode was good. Striking Vipers. You have to remind me what happened in Strike. I don't know the titles of the, of the episodes. And what about the assassin sniper, sniper be cyber bees? That one was fine, but it just felt a bit. It felt a bit. Uh, I don't know. It didn't feel quite right. <laughs> it didn't feel. It was. It felt a bit like too much. Assassin Cyber Bees. And then there was that that Netflix thing where you walk through and I was just like this there's video games that have done this for years and have done it much better. And so it kind of Oh, was that the one with Sam Mackey? And it's two friends and they don't realise that they're playing each other and then they do realise and they have sex in the video game the fighting game <laughs> Bandersnatch was bad I'm sorry it was bad I kind of got that one that one was fine the the striking vipers one yeah that was good I like Sam Mackey but it's again it just felt very clinical it felt very like they all reached a solution at the end where they like they were like happy that they were having sex in the game and the wife was happy and they were like yeah we're still bros like we don't actually have feelings for each other it's just the game satisfaction and stuff it just felt like the consequences weren't there that's the problem now like in the original few seasons the consequences were diabolical for people like there were some severe consequences for for, for their lives now white bear's different but the rest like some of them recently it's just like Oh god, this one that one was horrible. Yeah. The one where they were blackmailed into committing crimes of things found on their PC. Yeah. I, I, well, this is the thing, right? There was a I don't know if you got the ending where they randomly have like this a karate fight with the therapist or something. I was just like, what is happening? Like, what What, what am I meant to take away from this? <laughs> it was just a random martial arts fight in the middle between the therapist and the person. 
Oh God. I think I think the Americanization of 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 uh, Black Mirror has 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 fucked it up. It's made it really, uh, yeah, a lot less. Americans can't deal with a sad ending. That's that's what I've that's what I've got. Oh, then he doesn't he jump out the window and it's a set and they're like, why did you jump out the window and break the set or something like that? <laughs> like what the hell? Anyway, so let's get back on track. <laughs> yeah, but I think Charlie Brooke has lost some of his uh, creative control since it's come off the BBC and it's gone onto Netflix. I think that's the issue. I think the BBC kind of was like, yeah, do it, Charlie Brooker. But now Netflix are kind of like, interfering maybe because of the American audience are like we need happy endings we need things to be hopeful at the end of it and I think that's probably we don't mind a bit of uh like we're we're a pessimistic nation <laughs> so so we can have a bad ending and it's fine and I don't think America can handle bad endings <laughs> and that's the issue you're just too soft in America that's what it is <laughs> anyways so i have covered what machiavellianism is and we have we finally covered the dark triad i mean there's no more to it than that you get these three elements of somebody's life and Yeah, I know, Claire, but I'm talking generally. I'm not talking about you. Claire says she loves bad endings, yeah. But generally, America is like the idea is that you're hopeful, you're optimistic, you have the American dream, you go through turmoil to reach the, the end goal, which is, you know, always coming out on top. And if you don't come out on top, then there's an issue. The bad guy wins, there's an issue. That is the that's the American philosophy, so so of course Americans aren't gonna like it when the president has to fuck a pig to save a princess and the princess has already been released <laughs> and he didn't actually need to fuck a pig. That was, <laughs> you know, that's it. Yeah, you're a realist, Claire. You're different though. You're not. You're not. You're not all American. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the first season. It's the best season because it because it really was just simple. You know, there's the one with Donald Gleason in it where he's the the uh, the rope. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, Mark. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Um <laughs> Okay. Um What was I even saying before that? Oh, the one with Donald Gleason where he's a robot replacing himself because uh uh he died and then he, she got a robot that that replaced himself. That is a great episode because there's no like happy ending there. It's just a it's it's a commentary on what we would do to 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 avoid grieving essentially. And he did break me up. Thank you. <laughs> I just didn't expect that. Um, anyways, so we covered Machiavellianism, which is you know this this uh, goal driven uh, personality style which. Where people lack empathy and want to step on other people in order to reach their goals, they kind of don't care about goodness or morality. They they feel like there is just the way that they do things in order to to achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, we also covered narcissism and, and and psychopathy and how they interact with Machiavellianism to make the the dark triad and what the what the risks of a dark triad type personality are, which is a lot of manipulation, 
uh, a lot of uh, being taking advantage of people, have, being glib and superficial and, and appearing like you can, you've got the trust of someone and then them betraying you in some way. Um, and existing in society in positions of power because uh, they they broke the rules or they stepped on people in order to get to those positions. Um, so it really is a dangerous personality type. And, you you know, if somebody does have this personality type, they're more likely to, 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 to act in a criminal manner. Uh, I, I think, you know, if when we think about psychopathy, it tends to be people, psychopaths from low socioeconomic statuses are the ones that get caught for, like, violent crimes, like murder and, and stuff like that. In higher socioeconomic situations, they get, they tend to uh, acclimate to the to the environment, and they can abuse people in different ways. So they're more likely to commit crimes like lots of fraud type crimes uh, and big money crimes and uh, abuse systems in order to 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 abuse people. So you know maybe they become like the head of HR and just fire people here and there. Uh, Maybe they use their position of power to, to be sexually deviant within the workplace, but they won't be spoken up about because they're in a position of power. There's all these things. So so you see the the kind of uh, the issues with it. Now, I think with a dark tribe personality type, you'd see the same thing. If they were born into a low socioeconomic status and they can't reach the uh, legal position of power, then they will reach an illegal position of power. And that's really the problem. So you get people join gangs, people join, uh, you know, kind of illegal enterprises in order to, to achieve that kind of status uh, within a group of people, whilst also being able to abuse their position of power and, and use it to abuse others. So that's a real danger. So is there any questions from the chat before we finish up? I've had a great time. I need to blow my nose again. Put your questions in whilst I turn my camera off. Okay, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Doesn't seem like there's any more questions. So I think that's it, guys. And we finished. I'm not going to do another video on the Dark Triad because I feel like we've covered the, the dangers. Unless people really want me to go into detail about like kind of stats and stuff, how many people have Dark Triad personality. It's a small percentage of people. It's not really, it's really not that many. The likeliness of you meeting someone with dark triad personality types is very low because you not only have to meet someone that has psychopathy or, or has Machiavellianism or is narcissistic, you have to meet someone that has all three of these these personality types together. And the situation and the, the genetics that would be required for that happens very rarely. So uh, it's not something I would say watch out for in your daily life and certainly don't start doing what everyone does, which is now that you know about it, Spotting it in your daily life and going, that person has dark triad personality types. That person has dark triad personality types. That's unlikely to be true. Um, you know, the, the, there are people who don't have these personality styles who manipulate and abuse and and uh, uh, hurt other people, and they don't have any of these personality types. You know, that people can just be bastards. They don't need oh God. <laughs> they don't need to be narcissistic. They don't need to be Machiavellianistic. They don't need to be psychopathic in order to be a twat. Yeah. So 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 be careful before you label people because it could just be that they're an asshole rather than that they have this personality type that causes it.
Okay, and I think sometimes when we label people with these things, we're alleviating some of their responsibility for their for their actions. We're giving them an excuse uh, to to use when actually they just need to be held accountable. Yeah. So unless you want that, this is the last stream on it. Thank you for for hearing me out on this. I think I find this very interesting, even though it's very rare. Um, but you know, it can it can cause people a lot of pain a lot of suffering uh, encountering someone with these these types of personalities so so it's important that people are aware of them so that they can they can spot them when they can actually come up <laughs> that's fair enough mark yeah i mean if you know if you know your brother that you, your entire life and and the thing is right even if you don't label them publicly like you don't say this person has narcissism or whatever if you have in your head, this is kind of what narcissism is. This is the dangers of narcissism. This is how they can manipulate and abuse people. If you meet someone that meets those criteria, even if you're not actively saying, like, as like giving them a psychiatric diagnosis or being like, yeah, my brother's narcissistic and like telling everyone. If you're aware of it, you can avoid those tactics that, that he may use to try and manipulate you in those situations. And that's really the key. It's about kind of being wary of these things, being wary of the tactics that are used by these people whilst not actually kind of making an, a, a, an, affirmative, a, an affirmative statement that this is what they are. And I think that's more important. I think it's more important to be aware of the, the tactics and the potential for abusive or, or kind of like shitty behavior and how to respond to that rather than... Um, actively looking to label people and i think that's probably what you're doing mark anyway so and, and and that's really it it's just about defending yourself keeping yourself safe oh thank you i appreciate it keeping yourself safe in these situations making sure that you're not being taken advantage of yeah because because that's the thing you know people especially with our loved ones we we're very easy to take advantage of and if someone's got the in the right mind to do it then they will so we have to be careful and there's we've got to have boundaries and lines you know and if someone's taking the piss then you know you need to have a boundary around yourself because you've got to make sure you're looking after yourself there's no there's no there's no point in in uh you know just allowing someone to keep keep hurting you yeah Cool. So without further ado, thank you very much. Uh, guys, I would really appreciate it for all of you here and all of you who are watching on, on the rewatch. If you could just send me some suggestions about things you want to know about in psychology, that would be really helpful in me kind of directing my attention. Um, so, you know, I have I have uh, a few years of work in mental health and learning disabilities and autistic. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not playing on the screen here, Chris. We're just finishing up and uh <laughs> why are people <laughs> you've come too late. <laughs> um so if you if you want to know, you know, I have I have uh, my kind of specialties are forensic psychology, so anything to do with psychology and the criminal justice system. Uh and that includes things like juror reactions, eyewitness testimony uh that kind of stuff not it's not just about uh people who commit crimes uh i also have you know a couple of years of working in mental health services i worked in the acute mental health ward so i know everything not everything i know a lot about psychosis and uh bipolar and different personality disorders and stuff like that and i also have experience working in land disabilities and autism services so if you want to know about that stuff, that's good as well. So just send me some tweets or something. Just say I'm interested in learning about X, um, and we can do it. And Icarus said a wizard never comes too late. He he comes exactly at the time he intends to. And whilst you may be a fan of Gandalf Icarus, you are not a wizard, so you were late. <laughs> and with that, um say good night to all of you thank you for joining me it's been a pleasure and yeah i'll, I'll make sure that i i'm more consistent in the future so <laughs> bye everyone <laughs>